Well, today we're going to complete Acts chapter 1 and move on into Acts chapter 2. Now, we ended last time as Peter emerged as the spokesman of the young messianic movement. In fact, it is probably fair to say that as of the time of his speech to the 120 fellow believers gathered at the upper room in Jerusalem shortly after Yeshua ascended into heaven, that Peter was the de facto leader, even if not in any official capacity. Now, Peter was the logical choice as, as leader, at least for the time being. He was one of the original 12 disciples, also known as apostles, of Christ. Once, when Yeshua was, was, and the disciples had journeyed to Caesarea Philippi, Yeshua addressed the twelve, and he asked them who they thought he was. Peter immediately blurted out, you're the Mashiach, you're the son of the living God. To which Christ said to, to Peter, you are the rock. And upon this rock, I shall build my community. That seemed to be a clear enough endorsement by Yeshua such that the other 11 disciples accepted Peter as senior among them after Christ, of course. Well, let's reread part of Acts chapter 1 um, to ready ourselves for today's lesson. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, we'll be on page uh, 1360, Acts chapter 1. We're going to start reading at verse 15 and go to the end. <clears throat> During this period, when the group of believers numbered about 120, Kepha stood up, that's Peter, and addressed his fellow believers. Brothers, the Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit, spoke in advance through David about Yehuda, Judas. And these words of the Tanakh had to be fulfilled. He was a guide for those who arrested Yeshua. He was one of us. He had been assigned a part of our work. With the money that Judas received for his evil deed, he bought a field and there he fell to his death. His body swelled up and burst open. All his insides spilled out. This became known to everyone in Yerushalayim, so they they called that field Hakal Dema, which in their language means field of blood. Now, says Kepha, it is written in the book of Psalms, let his estate become desolate, let there be no one to live in it, and let someone else take his place as a supervisor. Therefore, one of the men who have been with us continuously throughout the time the Lord Yeshua traveled around among us, from the time Yochanan, John, was immersing people until the day Yeshua was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. And they nominated two men, Yosef bar Saba, surnamed Justice, and Matiao. And then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over the work and the office of emissary that Yehuda, Judas, abandoned to go where he belongs. Then they drew lots to decide between the two, and the lot fell to Matiao. So he was added to the eleven emissaries. Peter stands up in front of the 120, and he brings up a subject that addresses the here and the now. That is, just before Yeshua's ascension, he had instructed the disciples that they shouldn't focus on when or how Israel might throw off their Roman oppressors and gain independence because it's not for them to know. Rather, they should put their efforts into matters at hand. And one of those matters was to remain in Jerusalem in order to receive some kind of power that was going to be given them through the, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Now, the special power would enable them to obey their prime directive to go to all the Holy Land and then go to every corner of the planet with the good news of salvation. For Peter, the most important immediate matter was to bring the number of apostles back up to 12 since Judas had betrayed the, 
group and subsequently committed suicide. Why wouldn't 11 do? Why was it so critical? What was so critical about adding another one so that there would be again 12? It can be summed up by something Christ instructed them that we find in Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, 28, we read this. Yeshua said to them, Yes, I tell you that in the regenerated world, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones and judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Twelve thrones ju uh, judging twelve tribes, one disciple seated upon each throne. But as of that moment, they were one disciple short. That would have left a throne empty. And who knew? Who knew? when this regenerated world that Messiah spoke of would begin. I mean, might it begin very soon? Might this even be part of what the Father promised that Yeshua had spoken of? So, for Peter, there was a sense of urgency to hurry and replace Judas. But first, Peter wanted to assure everyone that the treason of Judas was foretold and therefore it wasn't an unexpected curveball thrown at God or at them. He explains that it was King David who prophesied this event and Judas who was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Now, there's an issue in this statement that needs some close examination and it's one of those issues that can be a little bit troubling for believers. The issue is that Peter says in verse 16, he, Judas, was a guide for those who arrested Yeshua. He was one of us. He had been assigned part of our work. Peter confirms Judas was a legitimate disciple. This man had even been assigned part of their work. Christ himself chose Judas. Christ was the one who assigned each disciple his work. Judas was, for lack of a better word, a believer. And yet, this hand-picked disciple, one of the original twelve, guided the temple police to come and arrest Yeshua in an infamous betrayal, the likes of which will never be equaled in human history. So using modern evangelical Christian lingo, after his crime and rebellion against Yeshua, was Judas still saved? Had he ever been saved in the first place? Didn't he believe in Jesus, even though he took money to turn against him? Aided, aiding and abetting Christ's crucifiers? I don't think I've ever heard of a Bible teacher or a pastor claim that Judas died as a confused but righteous man whose ultimate destiny was still heaven. Yet it is claimed by some denominations that if anyone at any time in their life believed in Christ, then no matter what happened from that point forward, no matter how wicked that person might become, regardless of, of lack of interest in bearing good fruit or obeying Messiah, no matter if that person completely turned against Yeshua and openly renounced him, they're still saved. Either that or they'd never believed, but were only pretenders. Judas was no pretender. He was hand-picked, literally, by the Messiah. As Peter confirmed and could still say, after all that Judas had done, he was one of us. The point is this, regardless of whether you adhere to the once saved, always saved doctrine, or you simply advocate for Christ, or you identify yourself as a follower of Jesus, that's not sufficient to be delivered from eternal death. Judas checked off both of those two boxes. Rather, we have to understand and sincerely acknowledge what Yeshua is. 
He is the Son of God, and He is Savior. And we have to submit to Him fully, just entirely. Judas believed in Yeshua as a Messiah who would lead the Jews in a rebellion against Rome and then reclaim self-rule. But for Judas, that apparently is where his belief began and ended. When it became clear to Judas that Christ wasn't going to lead a rebellion, Judas fell away and he turned against him. In fact, I suspect that Judas's later treason had a firm and earlier connection with Yeshua asking a famous question of his 12 disciples, including Judas, back in Matthew 16, which cuts right to the heart of the matter. In Matthew 16, 13 through 15, we read this. When Yeshua came into the ter territory around Caesarea Philippi, he asked his Talmudim, his disciples, who are people saying the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say Yochanan the Immerser, others Eliyahu, Elijah, still others Yermiel, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But you, he said to them, who do you say I am? Now, believing in what Yeshua is must accompany who Yeshua is for a saving belief to exist. Acknowledging his existence, even his teachings, that's not enough. Listen to what James says about it. James 2, 18 through 20. But someone will say, well, you have faith, I have actions. Well, show me this faith of yours without the actions, and I'll show you my faith by my actions. You believe God is one. Good for you. Demons believe it too. And they, the thought makes them shudder with fear. But foolish fellow, do you really want to be shown that such faith apart from actions is barren? So after Peter finished explaining, what happened to Judas? And that it was prophesied by David, now it's fulfilled, so what should be done? So Peter issues a quote from Psalm 109.8 as the answer. Let someone else take his place as supervisor. Verse 21 of Acts chapter 1 then outlines the qualifications for a replacement disciple. First and foremost, the replacement must have been traveling and living with the original 12 from the earliest times of Yeshua's ministry. Even from the day Christ was immersed by John the Baptist. This replacement also had to be present when Yeshua ascended up to heaven. But the focal point of the qualifications was so that this person could be a witness to Messiah's resurrection. Apparently, two men fit the bill. Yosef bar Saba and Matia, or in English, Joseph bar Sabas and Matthias. Two qualified men, one, one position available. Here's the thing. Obviously, there were others than only the 12 that followed Christ wherever he went. But the difference between that 12 and all others was that Christ had personally chosen and invited those 12 to be his inner circle. So since Yeshua was no longer here to voice his personal choice, how might the replacement be chosen in God's will? The answer? Casting lots. Casting lots was a rather common method used to reveal God's choice in a matter. So the group prayed to the Lord to reveal his choice and it turned out to be Matthias. Now the group was back to its full complement of 12. Well, let's move on to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, page 1361 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. <clears throat> the festival of Shavuot arrived, and the believers all gathered together in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from the sky like the roar 
of a violent wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire. They separated and came to rest on each one of them. They were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh. They began to talk in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem religious Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were confused because each one heard the believers speaking in his own language, totally amazed. They asked, how is this possible? Aren't all these people who are speaking from the Galil, from the Galilee? How is it that we hear them speaking in our native languages? We are Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Yehuda, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Jews by birth and proselytes, Jews from Crete and from Arabia. How is it that we hear them speaking in our own languages about the great things God has done? Amazed, confused, they all went on asking each other, what can this mean? But others made fun of them and said, ah, they just had too much wine. Then Cephas stood up with the eleven raised his voice to address him. He said, you Judeans, all of you staying here in Jerusalem, let me tell you what this means. I want you to listen to me carefully. These people aren't drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of uh, through the prophet Yoel, Joel. Adonai says, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon everyone. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my slaves, both men and women, I will I pour out from my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will perform miracles in the sky above, signs on the earth below, blood, fire, thick smoke. The sun will become dark, the moon blood, before the great and fearful day of Adonai comes. And then whoever calls on the name of Adonai will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Yeshua from Nazareth, was a man demonstrated to you to have been from God by the powerful works and miracles and signs that God performed through him in your presence. You yourselves know this. This man was arrested in accordance with God's predetermined plan and foreknowledge and through the agency of persons not bound by the Torah, you nailed him up on a stake and killed him. But God has raised him up, freed him from the suffering of death. It was impossible that death could keep its hold on him. For David says this about him. I saw Adonai always before me, for he's at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. With, uh, for this reason my heart was glad. My tongue rejoiced. Now my body, too, will live on, in the certain hope that you will not abandon me to Sheol, or let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will fill me with joy by your presence. Brothers, I know I can say to you frankly that the patriarch David died. He was buried. His tomb's with us to this day. Therefore, since he was a prophet and he knew that God had sworn an oath to him that one of his descendants would sit on his throne, he was speaking in advance about the resurrection of the Messiah that it was he who was not abandoned in Sheol and whose flesh did not see decay. God raised up this Yeshua and we're all witnesses of it. Moreover, he has been exalted to the right hand of God, is received from the Father what he promised, namely the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and he's poured out his, this gift, which you are both seeing and hearing. For David didn't ascend into heaven, but he says, Adonai said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let the whole house of Israel know, beyond doubt, that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Yeshua, whom you executed on a stake. And on hearing this, they were stung in their hearts, and they said to Kepha and the other emissaries, brothers, what should we do? And Kepha answered them, turn from sin. Return to God. Each of you be immersed on the authority of Yeshua the Messiah into forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift 
of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you. It's for your children, for those far away, as many as Adonai our God may call. And he pressed his case with them, with many arguments, kept pleading with them, save yourselves from this perverse generation. So those who accepted what he said were immersed, and there were added to the group that day about 3,000 people. They continued faithfully in the teaching of the emissaries, in fellowship, in breaking bread, and in prayers. Everyone was filled with awe. Many miracles and signs took place through the emissaries. All of those trusting in Yeshua stayed together. They had everything in common. In fact, they sold their property and possessions and distributed the proceeds to all who were in need, continuing faithfully and with singleness of purpose to meet in the temple courts daily, breaking bread in their several homes. Homes They shared food and joy and simplicity of heart, praising God, having the respect of all the people. And day after day, the Lord kept adding to them those who were being saved. This chapter speaks of the arrival of what the Father promised. What the Father promised that Yeshua had told his followers to wait for in Jerusalem. Because it was probably a week to the day from his ascension that the day of Pentecost arrived, their wait was short. Now we're going to get deep and we're going to get technical just for a little while. Because here at Pentecost is the starting point of establishing the framework from which we can understand all that happens from here forward in the book of Acts. And it also establishes some important context that's going to aid us in understanding Peter and Paul. Now, Pentecost is the English word for the Greek Pentecostos, which means 50. And Pentecostos is the Greek translation used for the Hebrew word Shavuot, which actually means weeks. Now, if you've been around Hebrew roots or Messianic Jewish teaching for very long, you know that Shavuot is one of the seven biblical feasts as ordained by God in the book of Leviticus. Let's not go any further until we understand what Shavuot is, both biblically and traditionally in Judaism, because if ever there is a key to unlock the understanding and context of this chapter, it is contained in the meaning of Shavuot to the Jews of that era. And before we start that discussion, please note, Pentecost is not a Christian holiday created by the church to commemorate the coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell men. Far from it. Pentecost, Shavuot, had been celebrated for 1,300 years by the Israelites by the time of the event we just read about here in Acts. Thus, the amazing events of that day happened on the ancient Jewish holiday of Shavuot. Now let's see if we can understand why the Lord chose that particular point in time for the Ruach HaKodesh to come and indwell humans. So first let's understand that Shavuot is part of a system of holy days ordained by the Lord. The first holy day of that system is Pesach, Passover. The next holy day is really a holy week called matzah, or unleavened bread. Matzah begins the day after Passover. Next follow, follows Bichrim, first fruits. First fruits takes place the next day after the Sabbath that follows Passover. And since the biblical Sabbath is always the seventh day of the week, then first fruits always falls on the first day of the week. And in modern times, we call this first day of the week Sunday. So, the first three feasts occur in rapid succession and they all happen in the month of Nisan. Pesach, Passover, is the first feast and it happens on a defined, biblically defined calendar date, Nisan the 14th. This is equivalent to our March-April time frame. So these are springtime festivals we're talking about. Now to be clear, the assigned dates and times and progression 
of these seven biblical feasts are scripturally defined. This is not Hebrew tradition. After the first three feasts, there's a lull of seven weeks before the next feast arrives, and that feast is Shavuot, hence the alternative name, the Feast of Weeks. Now, unlike Passover, that always occurs on the 14th of Nisan, the day of Shavuot arrives is not on a fixed calendar date. Rather, we are to count 50 days beginning on the day after Passover. That 50th day is Shavuot. Now, let's back up a little bit. When we talked about the three spring feasts, the third one was called First Fruits, Bichrim. But the reality is that Shavuot is also a First Fruits festival. Thus, both the third and the fourth biblical feast days revolve around agriculture and harvesting. The first two feasts, Passover and Unleavened Bread, do not. Those two are a remembrance of Israel's exodus from Egypt. The third festival, Bikarim, represents the first of the harvest of the barley crop. The fourth festival, Shavuot, Pentecost, represents the first of the harvest of the wheat crop. After Shavuot, there is a few month lull until the month of Tishri arrives, and then the fifth, sixth, and seventh feasts arrive in very quick succession. On the first day on the month of Tishri is the biblical feast called Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. Modern Jews have somewhat changed the nature of this feast day, formed it into a tradition and call it Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year. Then on the 10th day of Tishri comes the feast of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and then five days later, on the 15th day of the month of Tishri, begins the final feast of the yearly cycle of seven, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Tishri comes in the fall season. Now, we're not going to discuss these fall feasts. I just wanted to lay out the entire cycle or system of the seven biblical feasts for you. So let's return now to our discussion of the feast day that concerns Acts chapter 2, and that is Shavuot, Pentecost. Now, besides its original agricultural motif and significance, later on, it took on a dual meaning as commemorating the giving of the law, the giving of the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, because Exodus 19.1 tells us that the giving of the Torah occurred in the third month after Israel left Egypt, it's entirely probable that indeed Moses was given the Torah on a day that the following year, according to a commandment of Jehovah God, that was going to be given to him in the Torah, would henceforth be called Shavuot. I need you to pay close attention to what I'm going to tell you here in the next few minutes. You're going to get lost. The earliest known direct reference to the Feast of Shavuot being celebrated as the day the Torah was given on Mount Sinai is the 2nd and 3rd centuries A.D. And it is found in the Talmud tractates Shabbat and Pesachim. However, the Book of Jubilees also alludes to Shavuot's twofold nature. The Book of Jubilees was created in the 2nd or 3rd century B.C. So, what's most important for us to grasp is that whether or not God actually gave Moses the Torah at Mount Sinai on what became the day of Shavuot, this is not the point. The point is that starting well before the time of Christ, Judaism believed, firmly believed, that the Torah had been given on Shavuot. And so the Jewish Bible characters and the Jewish writers of the New Testament believed it. And they celebrated the day of Pentecost, Shavuot, with that dual purpose in mind. Why does that matter to us? Because the book of Acts is written with this understanding as its context. It was understood by Luke and Peter, all the disciples, all Jews, 
in addition to celebrating the first fruits of the wheat harvest, harvest, Shavuot for them was also celebrating the giving of the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai. You with me? This is important. And so this fact is naturally reflected in the story of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 when we know what to look for. Let me make a Hebrew scholar out of you. Midrash is a Hebrew term that means to discuss and then interpret scripture. But there's also a body of ancient Jewish literature called the Midrash. And in it, ancient sages and, and rabbis gave their recorded interpretations of many Bible passages, meaning, of course, the Hebrew Bible. Now, in the Targum uh, Pseudo-Jonathan, there is a fascinating interpretation of Midrash of Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, verse 15 in a complete Jewish Bible. That verse in our Bibles reads this. All the people experienced the thunder, the lightning, the sound of the shofar, and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled. So now this Midrash sets up the understanding that within Judaism, the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai came with flames and with fire. I want to repeat so that you understand why I'm taking you where I am. This Midrash I'm about to quote to you says that the giving of the Torah came to Moses with flames of fire. And when we see that the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost in the same way, we need to take notice. Here's part of this Midrash. The word that went out of the mouth of the Holy One, blessed be He, was like shooting stars and lightning and like flames and torches of fire. A torch of fire to the right, a torch of flame to the left. It flew, it winged swiftly in the air of the heavens. It turned around and it became visible in all the camps of Israel and by turning it became engraved on the two stone tablets of the covenant. Now once again, however true or fanciful, this midrash on the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai might be, doesn't matter. The issue is, this was the understanding of the Jewish people in Jesus' day. It wasn't questioned. It was as much a part of regular Judaism then as the cross is for regular Christianity now. But there is yet another element of this midrash that's every bit as important. So tune back in. Whereas in almost all Christian Bibles, we find the English words, all the people experienced the thunderings, or all the people witnessed the thunderings, in fact, that's not a correct translation. The Hebrew says they saw the thunderings. Thunder is a sound. Uh, we see the lightning, but we hear the thunder. See, this is why, instead of translating this verse literally, translators thought it nonsensical to write down, saw the thunderings. Instead, they wrote the words, experienced or witnessed, or some such fairly ambiguous word like that. But in another ancient Jewish writing called the Mikhilta, we find another midrash on this issue of how it could have been possible for the Israelites at Mount Sinai to see thunder starts out like this. They saw what was visible, heard what was audible. These are the words of Rabbi Ishmael. Rabbi Achaba says, they saw and heard that which was visible. They saw the fiery word coming out of the mouth of the Almighty as it was struck upon the tablets. As it is said, the voice of the Lord hewed out flames of fire. Psalm 29, 7. But how many thunderings were there? How many lightnings were there? It is simply this. <clears throat> they were heard by each man according to his capacity. As it is said, the voice of the Lord was heard according to the power. That's Psalm 29, 4. 
not with his power, but with power. That is, <clears throat> with the power of each individual, even to pregnant women, according to their strength. Yet another midrash of the events of Mount Sinai called Tanhuma, we find this. All the people saw the voices. Note that it does not say saw the voice, but saw the voices. Wherefore, Je Rabbi Jonathan said, uh, J pa pa pardon me, Rabbi Yohanan said, the voice went out and was divided into seven voices, and from seven voices into seventy tongues, so that all the nations would hear. And every nation heard the voice in its own tongue, and they were amazed. But the people of Israel heard the voice and were not hurt. I hope you understand what you're hearing. The rabbis taught that when the Torah was given on Mount Sinai, it was by means, given by means of flames and thundering. And the thundering was always seen as God's voice since time immemorial. Each person was able to perceive only as much of God's voice as each was capable. The rabbis also taught that this single voice that emitted from God and was heard at Mount Sinai became divided into to seven. Then the seven into seventy languages. Why seventy? Because in the table of nations in Genesis we are told that God divided the earth into seventy nations, each presumably with its own unique language. So the idea is the Torah was given on Mount Sinai in a way that all the languages of the earth, which was said to be considered 70, were represented. So that all the peoples of the earth had an opportunity to receive God's words that formed the Torah. Once again, whether these rabbis are right or not is debatable. The important matter is, this is what people in Yeshua's time believed. This was the standard, un, standard understanding within Second Temple Judaism. This is the context of understanding of the writers of the New Testament. And this is especially the context for the coming of the Holy Spirit on Shavuot, Pentecost. Let me say this more plainly. Luke is portraying the coming of the Holy Spirit on Shavuot hear me, as essentially the second coming of the Torah on Mount Sinai. For Luke, this awe-inspiring happening of the visible, noisy coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, complete with the flames and fire, many languages, is the second Mount Sinai event, only this time it's happening on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. But more than Luke merely accepting what is happening in the context is based on some Jewish traditions that had come from the midrash of important rabbis, there is also the fulfillment of biblical prophecy that's occurring. Listen to this from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 30 through 32. Here, the days are coming, says Adonai, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with the fathers on the day I took them by their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, because for their part they violated my covenant, even though for my part I was a husband to them, says Adonai. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said Adonai. I'll put my Torah within them. I'll write it on their hearts. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. God says that the difference between the new covenant and the older covenant, Moses' covenant, isn't the content. It's the means of giving it. The older covenant was given out in the desert, up on Mount Sinai, written down on stone tablets. But this new covenant is that God is going to write that same Torah not on the stone. He's going to write it in the flesh of human hearts. He will quite literally 
insert the Torah into the bodies of his people. But where will this occur? How will it happen? Part of that answer comes from a prophecy in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah 2-3 we read, Many peoples will go and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of Adonai, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us about his ways. We will walk in his paths, for out of Zion will go forth Torah, the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. Isaiah says that a time's going to come when the Torah will go forth from Zion, God's word from Jerusalem. That is, this next time that the Torah... God's word comes to humanity, it's not going to come to Mount Sinai. It's going to come out of Jerusalem. And where were the disciples when the Holy Spirit, the word of God, came and embedded itself in them on Mount Zion in Jerusalem? How did it come? With flames, fire, fire noise like a rushing wind, languages from every nation on earth, just like the rabbi said it had been on Mount Sinai. It was no coincidence that the Holy Spirit came on Shavuot. It was no coincidence that he came in the manner he did using the same signs and miracles that the Jewish sages said had occurred at Mount Sinai 13 centuries earlier. The observers and recipients of this amazing, probably terrifying, aerial display were Jews in Jerusalem perceiving everything that was happening within the framework of a Jewish culture, customs, thinking, all Jewish. One of the things that God shows us in His Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments, and in our personal experiences with him is that he communicates with each of us. He deals with each of us in ways we can personally understand and take meaning from. The Jews of Yeshua's day had long been taught that the power of God on Mount Sinai manifested itself in noise, flames and fire, and many languages. This knowledge was a given. Every Jewish child grew up knowing it. So when those same signs and miracles that supposedly happened on Mount Sinai also happened on the first Shavuot after Yeshua ascended, then those who had the eyes to see, the ears to hear, understood that Jeremiah's and, his, and, and, and Isaiah's prophecies, they were fulfilled at that moment. For these Jews, it was the second coming of the Torah. And it was the Holy Spirit who brought the Torah this time. And it was implanted internally within individuals, rather than being inscribed externally on stone tablets. Who understood this awesome reality? Only. Jewish believers in Messiah, and probably not even all of them. But now you understand it. And we all need to be about the work of explaining this to a Gentile church that has so misunderstood what happened on this particular Shavuot in Jerusalem. And it has caused a terrible rift between Jews and Christians, as well as the creation of numerous church doctrines that are well off the mark. The content of the new covenant was not new. It was just the older covenant renewed. And it was renewed by means of the Holy Spirit embedding that original Torah deep into the hearts of Christ's worshipers to enable a much deeper devotion to it. Next time we'll continue in Acts chapter 2 and we'll explore other aspects of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Thank you.